Hi, my name is Doug Walters, and this is my sidekick, Bel Air. We're at the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, uh, the Susquehanna Watershed Environmental Education Program up in Pennsylvania, where we explore creeks similar to this one and bigger. And I'm going to share with you guys today some ways that we can tell the relative health of a stream. Uh, so there's multiple different things we can look at. There's three big categories that we break it down into. One of them is the physical aspect of the stream. So what's it look like? What's in it? What's surrounding it? Next one is what's living in it, the biotic sample. So looking at the creatures that are living in and around the stream. And then the last one is the chemical testing. So looking at the pH, the nitrates, the phosphates, uh, different things like that to tell us what's actually in the water. That one's a little hard to do. So we're gonna focus mostly on physical stream assessments and then the macro invertebrates, the biotic indicators, the things that are living in the stream. Uh, the physical stream assessment, you can do without even getting wet. The macros, you might have to get your toes wet and at least your hands wet. Uh, so we're going to take a little dive into this to figure out what different streams can tell us. Alright, so the physical stream assessment. This is the assessment we can do just by standing next to a creek or even looking at a picture of a creek. We can tell some of these things. Uh, driving by one, or if you have one in your neighborhood somewhere that you can see, uh, this is something you can do pretty simple. Uh, so the first things that we're going to look at are turbidity, the clearness of the water. Can we see to the bottom? Can we only see in an inch or so? Is it really cloudy, murky, muddy looking? Uh, is it dark? Uh, depending on where you live, the water might have different colors due to the trees and the plants that are growing around it. Uh, sometimes if you're in an area with a lot of pine trees or hemlocks, the water gets kind of a, a reddish color, and that's tannin, so that's natural. We're really looking for that mud color. If it's brown and it looks like uh, chocolate pudding floating down the river. The next one's trash. Whether or not there's trash in or directly adjacent to the river will tell us a little bit about its health. The smell of the water. All right, this is kind of an interesting one to do. If you walk near that stream and there is like a, a an odor coming off of it that you don't know what it is, but it doesn't smell good, probably not a good sign, right? If you walk up to it and you're like, ah, it smells like, you know, what a creek should smell like. You know, it doesn't seem odd to you. That's a good thing. If it has any sulfury or rotten egg smells, sometimes not the best thing. The next thing is riffles. So riffles are areas where the water is going over rocks in shallow areas. So if you look right behind me, we've got a little, what I would call a little riffle here floating down this creek. It's where there's little bits of oxygen getting mixed into the stream. And we'll dive deeper into riffles in a minute. After that, we have water temperature. Now this time of year, it's kind of hard to imagine because most of the water we're gonna touch is gonna be kind of chilly. But in the summer, it might warm up. So this one, what you're gonna do is you're gonna feel the water temperature. If it's nice and cool, that's a good thing because it holds more oxygen. Warm water doesn't hold as much oxygen in it. So it's not as good for those macroinvertebrates, the other living things like fish and things like that in the stream. So we want nice cold water. Next would be the stream bank erosion. So erosion is a natural process that can be sped up by many different things, uh, impervious surfaces like pavement, sidewalks. Uh, if we have natural forest on either bank of the stream, usually erosions at a minimum depending on what's upstream. And this would be the edges of the stream. What do they look like? Are they steep edges straight down to the water? Are they nice and gradual like the ones behind me where you can see that they kind of slant down into the water? And I'll show you some more examples of erosion. The next one, riparian buffer zone. Now this is a pretty complicated sounding word or set of words, riparian buffer zone. So riparian means alongside of, buffer is uh, protection against something and zone also right next to. So we're looking at what's directly next to the stream. Right? And that will tell us a lot about the health because the things along the stream edges, the banks, that's what's filtering water as it's coming into the stream. It's stopping different things that we don't want in the stream from getting here. So this one, as you look back behind me, you can tell it is all forest. It's all trees and shrubs and it's natural. And that's what we really want. That's an ideal riparian buffer zone. You have at least 20 yards to 100 yards of 
nice forested buffer or, mar or marsh or shrubs and it's not just mowed grass or pavement right up to the edge of the stream and I'll show you guys some examples of that. Next one, uh, tree debris. So this one, if we're going to look down in the stream, we want to see leaves, we want to see sticks, we want to see bark, we want to see stuff coming off of the, the buffer zone, that riparian buffer, and making its way down into the creek. All right? And there's many different reasons for that. One of those things is the fact that a lot of creatures that live in the stream will feed off of that that detritus, that debris that is falling off of the trees and it's breaking down in the stream. There's lots of little critters that love to eat that. And it's also providing shelter for animals to hide in and around so they don't become prey for larger animals. All right. Next one are the rocks, the bottom. All right. So when we're looking at the bottom of a stream, we really want to see a mixture of larger rocks and some smaller rocks in between but we don't want it to be really muddy bottom. If it's a muddy bottom, that means there's a lot of erosion probably coming into that creek, so the stream banks aren't that stable, and there's no place for animals to, to hide in the mud or to have uh, lay their eggs uh, for future generations. So we want that nice cobbly rock bottom. If you look back behind me, this stream has a relatively decent rock bottom, and we'll look into more of this as we go. So next we're going to hop around to a few different creeks that I have around me here that we can see some examples of healthy streams and not so healthy streams. And we'll look at the differences between the two and talk about why one is healthy and one might not be the greatest stream and what could be done to make it better. All right, so here we have a pretty good looking stream bank. It's nice and gradual coming down to the creek. There's no big cliffs or drop-offs. And a lot of that is because of the buffer zone around this stream. If you look behind me, it's pretty much all forested. Lots of roots to hold this soil in so it doesn't get down into the creek and cause turbidity and issues farther down with all that sediment traveling in the creek. So this is what we want our stream banks to look like. Uh, even on a bigger scale, we don't want those drop-offs. We want nice gradual banks on either side. So this is an extreme example of stream bank erosion. As you can tell, the stream bank itself is taller than me, and I'm right about six foot, a little over six foot tall. So this is a lot of exposed soil. So this would lead to having sediment in the water, right? Having dirt get into the water, which would affect our turbidity. And that's not a good thing. So we don't want stream banks to be a cliff like this. We want a nice gradual slope into the stream. Uh, where the water can trickle down nice and easily during rainstorms. So here's another example of that stream bank erosion, something we see a lot more of in areas that have no trees on the banks, like this, where you have mowed grass right up to the edge, so the roots are only going in a couple inches to stabilize the bank. The soil doesn't have that stability for high water events, so it just washes away with the water. Uh, putting that sediment or the soil into our creek and stream. So water temperature is another one of the physical things we want to look at when we're looking at our creeks to tell the health. And you can do this a couple different ways. You can use a thermometer, of course. If you have an old one laying around, you can stick it in the water, find out the temperature. You can stick your hand in, tell whether it's hot or cold. We really just don't want it to be really hot. Uh, really hot water isn't that great for most creatures unless you're uh, pan fish like you'd find in a pond, bluegills, uh, a lot of bass, things like that. But we're not going to typically find those on small creeks and streams. We want nice cool water for the trout. Now I have developed a uh, highly tuned sense with my feet for water temperature. Uh, so right now I'm measuring this creek in to be right around 56.4 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's pretty good temperature. Uh, this is what we want. And in the summertime, it probably doesn't get that that much warmer than this because if you look around us we have tons of trees right and of course what do trees have in the summertime that might stop this water from warming up yeah leaves all that shade will provide this stream with the protection from the sun so it doesn't heat up in the summertime so there's another one of those benefits of having a great buffer zone along your stream 
is that it provides shade for the stream to help keep the temperatures low. So now that we've talked about the physical assessment of a stream, we're going to talk about the biotic sample, right? We're going to talk about the living things that live in the streams that can tell whether or not streams are healthy. So there's lots of things that live in the stream, big and small, depending on how big this stream is. We're going to be really looking at what we call macro invertebrates. So macro, meaning big enough that we can see with our eye, and then invertebrate means no backbone. So we're vertebrates. Things like crayfish, uh, snails, those are invertebrates, and many other examples. Dogs, vertebrates. So we're going to be looking for macroinvertebrates in the stream, and we break them down into a couple different categories uh, that tell us the health of a stream. They're what we call indicator species. Bel Air is an expert searching for macroinvertebrates, so she'll probably find some as well. Uh, but the main way we look for them is we're going to be looking at the rocks on the bottom of the stream. We're going to look in the leaf litter, that tree debris that we want in the stream. Uh, from our physical assessment. We're going to look in here for little guys moving around and we're going to identify them with the help of a dichotomous key to tell whether or not the stream is healthy or not. So by lifting up the leaf litter and looking through it nice and close, we're looking for pretty much anything that moves in these leaves. to try to find some of these macroinvertebrates. It's important though, once you've lifted up leaves to look at, that we make sure we put them back in the stream uh, because there might be some things living on them that we didn't see and if we put it on the bank, they're gonna dry out and we don't want that. So make sure you're looking nice and close because some of these guys are quite small. So I haven't found anything in this leaf pack yet, this leaf litter. Uh, so we're going to start picking up some rocks. So when you pick up rocks, you have things like this right here on this rock. This is actually the home of a macroinvertebrate. This is a caddisfly case. So caddisflies kind of build a, a house around them made out of rocks to protect them and then they sit under the rock and they reach out and grab things floating by for food uh, which is pretty cool there are a couple different types of caddisflies this is the case building kind there are net spinning ones as well as free living ones uh, but they're pretty cool to look at so not every rock you pick up is going to have anything on it so sometimes it's just a, a game of walking through a creek, picking up rocks and leaves and looking close to see if you can find anything. So we got a few things crawling around on this big rock. There's one right here by my thumb. And then the same creature up here. So these are what we call aquatic sow bugs. They're pretty cool little creatures. They are isopods. You can see all their little legs under there, right there, and a tent, and, oops, sorry. You can see all their legs, and their antennae up here in the front. So they're pretty cool. We'll be able to identify to figure out where they go on our healthy, not healthy list of macroinvertebrates. So here's another example of a caddisfly, this little guy right here. You can see him, this is a free living caddisfly though. So he doesn't build a house like the one we saw on the bottom of that rock. But I found him in these leaves, uh, chomping away on the leaf. I'm not finding a ton of different things here. That doesn't mean they're not here. Uh, just have to spend more time looking. But this is something you can do in your neighborhood stream. Just finding the critters that are living in amongst the leaves and the rocks on the bottom of the stream uh, will tell us a lot about the health of the stream. We break them down into three categories. We have sensitive creatures, which they can't handle much pollution. Uh, then we have facultative, which they can handle a little bit of pollution, and then tolerant species, which can pretty much live anywhere they want. Now, if we find a mix of all three of those, usually it means our stream is in okay health. 
because sensitive creatures cannot live with pollution. But yet tolerant creatures, they can live in clean water. Just because you find something that's in that tolerant category doesn't mean that the stream is bad. It just means that it has more creatures living there. And of course, we want a bunch of different things living in our streams because that's biodiversity. And the more diverse the, the animals that are living in the streams are, uh, the more diverse the ecosystem is. So the more creatures we have living in here, the more things that eat them there are around, and the more species we have in general. And that indicates a healthier stream. Because if a stream's not healthy, it usually can't support a bunch of different species. So it's good to find a bunch of different things, even if some of them are in that tolerant category, and not all of them are in the, in the sensitive category.